Um, let me start with a bit of history, which I always enjoy, uh, since I'm basically a historian by trade. Uh, we've had in the last century three really severe financial crises. Uh, in the US, particularly, 1922, uh, after a period of very strong growth and stable prices. The US had a wonderful period in 22, 29, when growth was very strong. Um, it was a time when the car industry was developing, consumer durables, radio, electricity, and so on. And product prices, goods and services prices, were really quite stable. Um, again, in Japan, their great period was in the 70s and 80s, particularly in the 1980s. Uh, you may recall that in the 1980s, people thought that the current century was going to be the Japanese century. Um, and the great moderation, uh, 1993 to 2007. At that time, most central banks had adopted inflation targets, mostly of 2%, and they, almost all of them hit their targets pretty well exactly. Uh, it was what Mervyn King described as the nice years, non-inflationary, uh, continuous expansion. But although goods and services prices during these periods were stable, um, the asset prices were not. Uh, because the 1920s saw this huge rise in equity prices in Wall Street, in Japan, as you may remember, the, um, uh, the value of the uh, royal palace in Tokyo, at one stage, the value of the land was greater than the value of the whole of California. Uh, in the great moderation, as Tim has already said, by the end of that period, uh, housing prices uh, and indeed equity prices uh, what 
inflation, and particularly for asset price increases, uh, whether housing or equity or any other, uh, was so bad by itself, so immoral, that what we've got to do is to purge the system. Uh, and there's actually a new book out by, uh, uh, by a couple of American uh, monetarist economists, Timberlake and Humphrey, uh, arguing that uh, members of the Federal Reserve Board actually went so far as to deny any credit, including credit based on real bills, uh, because they had in the past supported or been prepared to lend on margin for speculation in Wall Street. Similarly, in Japan in 91-92, uh, the then governor of the Bank of Japan, whose name temporarily escapes me, uh, refused to offset the very sharp decline in asset prices and in money supply as well, uh, because they felt the need to purge the system of the speculative excesses that had occurred at the end of the 1980s. At least this didn't happen uh, under the Great Moderation, uh, where although the central bankers were undoubtedly uh, at fault for not having foreseen either the onset or the severity of the, of the great uh, financial crisis, when it actually occurred and took place uh, in, after the Lehman crisis in September uh, 2008, they did turn around and undertake crisis measures, which at the time had the effect of checking uh, the very, very sharp uh, crisis. I mean, the number of people who began to doubt whether their banks were safe uh, was growing quite rapidly. People were really worried that the whole financial system and with it our economic system might simply fall into bits. And the central bankers actually at that time uh, managed to reverse that by taking steps uh, that were, uh, as people like Paul Volcker and some of the German central bankers argued, were on the margin of legality uh, given what central banks' uh, uh, legal mandate actually might be. So another thing that the um, central bankers forgot, and as indeed most people did, uh, was the dictum by an American economist called High Minsky, a rather splendid character with a huge beard, uh, that price stability not only is not, does not guarantee financial stability, but ev eventually it actually is inimical to financial stability because it leads, it leads ultimately to financial instability. And there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, when you get a period of very strong growth and stable prices, and remember all these three predecessors to the great financial crisis were just that, uh, it leads to expectations of strong profits into the far distant future. Um, uh, for example, um, in the great housing booms in the UK, of which there have been several, uh, one led up to 1973-74, uh, another led up to 1991-92, uh, another led up to 2007 um, If you were at a party, in, particularly in London, uh, the normal form of con conversation was how much has your house increased in price over the last six months? And the answer was actually really quite a lot. Uh, unfortunately, I, people, you and me, are myopic. And we tend to extrapolate into the future what we've seen in the past. And so when you get a really good period, people think it's going to go on forever. Uh, most of those employed in investment banks have only been there for about four or five years, and they get to a point where they've never known anything except good times, and so they assume that it will continue. And particularly, the belief that good times will continue 
uh, are strengthened if they're supported by central bank support at times of financial weakness. Uh, what was known as the Greenspan put, uh, whenever the uh, Wall Street went down very sharply uh, in the period between 1990 and 2007 eight, um, the uh, Fed actually started to lower interest rates. Moreover, there were a number of generally accepted myths that most people believed. Uh, Tim didn't, but most everybody else did. First one was as long as there was price stability, that's goods and services prices, and the Basel II capital adequacy re requirements was maintained, there was no solvency risk. People thought that the banks in the advanced countries of the West, as long as they maintained the Basel II requirements, and we had price stability, they thought that there would be no financial crisis. No banks would ever default. They thought the default of banks was something 19th century alone. Um, bank default was something that happened in emerging economies. It didn't happen in our economies. Now, with no solvency risk, there was no need for any liquidity requirements. Because if you believed that your bank was always going to be solvent, then you could always borrow. And you could borrow in the international uh, wholesale markets, euro dollar market, uh, the interbank market, uh, whichever uh, sort of wholesale market you like to name. So there was no need for liquidity requirements. Um, when I was young, which alas was over 50 years ago, uh, the commercial banks in the UK uh, held a liquidity ratio of a mixture of cash, short-term bills and government debt of uh, somewhere around 28 to 30 percent. By the time we got to 2007-8, the liquidity ratio of the commercial banks in the UK was somewhere around 1.5%. So when fears came about uh, potential solvency, and they could no longer borrow in these wholesale markets, they had to sell assets. And the sale of assets drove prices down, which drove their solvency down even further. And so you got what was known as a sort of a, a, another sort of amplifying spiral of problems. Now, monetary expansion and credit growth are very closely related to asset price booms. Uh, the BIS now regards as being financial cycles. Uh, actually, you saw some of those in Tim's charts with the financial cycle peaking uh, in 2007 8 and then a decline. It's not really sort of recovered yet, at least not in those countries which suffered the great financial crisis most severely. Um, uh, now, the, as Tim indicated, the central bankers now mostly. Uh, or try and guide themselves by the star, of what is known as R star, which is the equilibrium real interest rate. Nobody quite knows where it is. I mean, economics is extraordinary in the sense that what it describes as real is often something you can never observe and never see, uh, such as the real interest rate. Um, but again, you have to be very careful about this. And this is where, again, where the monetary aggregates come in. Because a lot of borrowing is related on the basis of the collateral the borrower has to put up, uh, and for the purpose for which the borrower is taking the money out, uh, with property and other asset prices. And the movement of property prices is frequently very distinct from the movement of goods and services prices. So the monetary and credit movements are as much interrelated with asset markets as they are with real interest, with the goods and services markets. They're interrelated with both. And since financial instability is very largely a function of excessive financial booms and busts, that is a reason why you need to look uh, at what is happening to credit and money, uh, as well as the estimates uh, of both nominal and real in the sense of deflated by goods and services prices. <laughs>
So where are we now? Um, well, housing varies greatly by country and region. Uh, the countries which suffered the financial crisis, such as the US, UK, Ireland, uh, uh, Portugal, uh, and indeed quite a lot of, of the continent, including Germany, uh, don't have much in the way of a housing price. Housing prices are now on the whole lower in these countries than they were in 2007-8. Some of those countries that didn't have a housing, crisis, a housing crisis then have subsequently seen huge expansion in housing prices. Sweden around Stockholm, Canada, Toronto, Vancouver. Uh, there are countries where housing prices have, have, have rocketed up. Moreover, we've got share and bond prices, both of them enormously inflated. Uh, and this is rather a conundrum because the bond prices are only so high because people think that interest rates must remain very low because people think that we're going to be in a period of continuing very low inflation and rather stagnation, very slow output growth. But if we're going to have very slow output growth, then it's very hard to see why equity prices are as high as they are because there aren't going to be the profits there. So either the equity prices are unsustainable, or the bond prices are unsustainable, or maybe both are unsustainable. Either way, it doesn't look to be very encouraging. Meanwhile, the, uh, the share prices have been, expansion has been made worse by, and indeed our economic situation has been made worse by the, what's the bonus culture and short-termism, uh, whereby the remuneration of the CEOs and lead managers are based on what happens to their equity prices during the period they're in office. Now equity prices are most easily raised by buybacks and dividends. And buybacks and dividends increase leverage and they, they, they drive of CEOs has been to push in this direction rather than to increase longer term uh, investment. With the result that the leverage uh, of our corporations, non-financial corporations, particularly in the US but in other countries, uh, particularly in Asia, uh, China, Indonesia and many others, uh, has reached really very frightening levels. The leverage of non-financial corporations is now much, much higher over the world as a whole than it was in 2007-8. Uh, so we're in a situation where corporations are highly levered, increasingly fragile, and the central bankers don't dare raise interest rates much from the present levels for fear of driving a lot of these corporations and some of the public sector. Uh, where the debt ratios have been going up faster and greater than ever before in peacetime. So we can't raise interest rates without pushing towards a further crisis. But the longer that interest rates remain at these rock bottom levels, uh, the longer we're going to have uh, the incentive to take up much more in the way of debt, because debt is very cheap very cheap to, uh, because the interest rates are so low, it's very easy to uh, meet the debt service requirements. So are we in a liquidity trap? So what are we going to do? How are we going to respond? Well, there's a problem about leaning against the wind because raising interest rates sort of <clears throat> tends to bring about uh, slower growth and recession. And given the degree of leverage, um, the moment the corporate sector, if not the banks, but the corporate sector is in, in a very exposed position. Can we do macro prudential? Well, there's a problem of cyclical, whether the macro prudential measures would be su sufficiently uh, powerful to have these effects. And in certain areas, there'd be a political backlash. A lot of macro prudential is aimed at the housing market, um, but the housing market is highly political. A macro prudential tightening 
are effectively tends to make borrowers and frequently young marrieds unable to afford housing. And that's politically very difficult to do. What everyone is now asking, given the lack of ammunition that central bankers have with interest rates which are, if anything, far too low, uh, and an expansion of their balance sheets which, if anything, is far too high, people are saying that what should be happening is fiscal expansion wherever possible. Uh, the space for that, particularly with the forthcoming aging of our economies, which is going to increase massively the public expenditure on uh, health and pensions. Uh, the space for fiscal expansion is limited in many countries. And in some of the countries where there is room for fiscal expansion, um, you all know who I mean, um, there's a tendency to refrain and refuse to try it uh, on the grounds that the debt ratio or debt uh, public sector debt should not be expanded. So are we going to have coordination of fiscal and monetary policy? Um, if so, it's really going to be fiscal policy that has to take the lead. Uh, monetary policy can only, in this sense, provide a support in not pushing interest rates up too far and too high and cause trouble for our over-indebted corporations. Uh, it's, it's the, the future for the central banks and the future for the world uh, is really looking fairly dodgy. Um, slowing labor force, over-indebted corporations, central banks which seem to be stuck uh, into what is still the crisis conditions of exceptionally low interest rates, exceptionally high business, um, balance sheet expansion, and they don't seem to know or be able to get out of that and normalize.